was a text I wrote uh, in 2010 for my pod, pod place project. Um, <laughs> I almost forgot the name of it. So I want to read that one first, and then I'm going to read a uh, excerpt from uh, Landline, and maybe talk very briefly about the journey from writing uh, Look Up to Landline and how my thinking about audio plays, locative audio plays has changed a little bit. So I'm going to do a little um, roulette here. Well, I'm just going to start at the beginning. So um, I'm going to also read the stage and sound directions because I feel like that's an important part of this script. So this is section one. The location is at the top of a spiral staircase in the Woodward's atrium. The sound is a field recording of the room. The music, none. Everything I'm about to tell you happened. It may seem like I'm making it up. It may seem like I'm talking about someone else, but I'm not. I'm talking about you and me. I want you to remember. Close your eyes. And you could close your eyes if you wanted. Mm. Ever feel like this is it? Do you remember saying that? How about, what were you thinking when you chose me? Or, from the first moment we met, I could imagine the end. Imagine the end. Open your eyes. I'll take you there, don't worry, just follow me. Turn around and walk down the stairs. Do you see the elevators? Turn left and walk through the exit doors. We switch to a field recording of the room that fades out and music fades in. I keep all your letters in a blue folder, your letters from the beginning, and all the postcards you sent me from all the cities all over the world. Walk through the exit doors. You walk through the exit doors. Are you sure you don't want to come with me? It's not that I don't want to, I can't. Section three. The music you hear becomes tinny and far away. This is the overpass. Stop. Look outside. Dissolve to another overpass in another city. 20 years ago, you had a job in an office tower in Calgary answering phones. I had a job in a tower five blocks away. Our towers were connected by overpasses like this one. We met for lunch without going outside, which was nice, especially in the winter. Remember winter? We sat in the windows and watched the traffic moving in both directions. And you said, which way do you want to go? I flipped a coin. Tails, west. Then we went back to work, quit our jobs, and started driving. Cut to now. Keep moving out the exit door. Promise you won't freak out? I'm not sure things are working between us. I guess I should say, I don't know if things between us are working for me. Don't freak out. The music goes out. The sound is a field recording of the elevator lobby. The location is the elevator lobby. See the elevator? Press the up button. Inside the elevator, press R. The sound is the real sound of the real elevator. We only met 20 years ago, so how much could I possibly know you, you know? Oh, we're here. Step out of the elevator, turn to your left, exit by the door around the corner. All of the field recordings and sounds fade out. We go outside. There it is. We're on the roof of a parkade, so there's nothing above us. There it is. This is it. This is what we wanted. Walk towards the tall buildings and everything they hold. Look up. You see that building that looks like a flying saucer? The tower with the revolving restaurant on top. It was too rich for us back then. We were living off of instant noodles and craft dinner. But then you made a friend who worked at the front desk, and she would sneak us into the elevator to the viewing level. Walk briskly towards the flying saucer as it fades from view. Stay to the left. 
cut to interior inside the tower. The music is a drone. You are leaning your forehead against the windows and looking down at the city lights in the night. You're teasing me. You're daring me to climb up onto the ledge and lie back against the window. Let me take your picture. I'm doing it. And you're saying, don't look down. You're laughing. We're laughing. Cut to the rooftop now. Do you see an arrow to your right? Stop and turn right. Do you see how to get to the other side? So we're on top of a parkade and you can see the other side here. Follow the arrow. It will lead you toward the mountain. You can't always see them, but trust me, they're there. Stay right, okay? I don't want you to get hurt. We were laughing, but I was lying. I was hiding, my legs twitching, fight or flight, my muscles braced, waiting for that pane of glass to break free of its housing and crash down to the ground. You wouldn't remember that, I never told you. Stop and turn around for a second. Look up. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. So that's um, look up uh, and I want to point out, like, I want to point out some features, the use of the of the second person, like you, all all the time. So I was, what I was trying to do was implicate the listener that this is their journey that they're taking. So then we'll cut over to landline. Um, this is so landline. I'm just gonna come down to. Sorry, one moment. All right. In Landline, you are directed to take a walk out uh, in the city um, and find your way not by geographic landmarks, but by landmarks of energy or memory or emotion. So I'll start with the first scene, when you're supposed to find your first location. For this first scene, you will need to find a location that reminds you of an old friend. The answer may be obvious and you may see a place right away. On the other hand, you may have to ask yourself, what, it, what is it about this place that reminds you of someone I know? You have one minute, so act quickly. When you're happy with your spot, simply stand by. So we give you one minute to find your location. Now stop. Observe the place you've chosen for the first rendezvous. Look behind you. Imagine that the person you miss is standing there. Wave to them as if they are walking up to you. I understand this will be hard at first. You may think you're alone, or you maybe you feel a little anxious because nobody is waving back. Imagine them waving back. Or, what if I told you there is a person, a mere, oh, 1,500 meters away from you, or let's say 150 kilometers away from you, and despite that distance, the two of you are engaged in the same activity. You are together. You are both waving. You can take my word for it, or you can check right now by sending a message to the number you were given. If you trust me, no need to message but we can wait a moment to see if your scene partner shares your sense of trust. Right now, they are looking at their phone. This act is about here and there. Lights up. Introduce yourself. Message the number you were given at the beginning. Give yourself a name and describe yourself. We give you 50 seconds to do that. You have 30 more seconds. Fill the time with words. Describe the location you're standing in and what it is about your friend that caused you to pick this location. We give you a minute and a half to do that. Describe the last time you talked. We give you a minute and a half to do that. Lights down. Consider the parallels between your experience here in Vancouver and your partner's experience in Kitchener. We give you time to do that. From time to time, you will be given opportunities like these to reach out to your scene partner. The two of you can message as much or as little as you like. It's up to you to negotiate together. Some people like to talk. 
Some people like to answer. Some people like to listen, and for some people it depends. Is there anything you'd like to say to your scene partner right now? This is your cue to start moving. You have the courage to explore if you want. And maybe I'll just leave it at that. That's about 15 minutes. So that was a little, tiny little excerpt of Landline. Adrian? Yeah. Can, um, for, for Look Up and the pod plays, can you kind of give a little bit more of a vision about what the user, what the audience was doing at that point? Well? Absolutely. So for the pod plays, um, The user would get, the audience member would get, have either provided to them by us an uh, iPod or they would download the audio track to their um, personal device mm -hmm. and we would give them a map and we would direct them to go to the starting location. So for that play that you just heard, the starting location, if you're familiar with SFU Woodwards, there's that spiral staircase that looks like an umbilical cord. Um, if you go to the very, 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 very top of that, it just ends with a piece of plexiglass so you don't fall off. So that was the starting point of our play. Um, and the, the narration of the story is interspersed with directional text that moves them, takes them on a journey. So they're listening to me telling them where to walk through space and then in the time that it takes them to traverse that space, they're getting snippets of the story that relate to the, um, the environments that they're in. And for that play particularly, um, I let, I chose the route and then I walked through the route and uh, tried to let the spaces talk to me and use that as the leaping off point for the narrative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, they're all nodding. <laughs> Um, but I'm curious about this Dare You project, if you can describe it. Sure. Because Kathleen makes it sound impossible to describe. Uh, it's not impossible to describe. It was almost impossible to pull off. But um, um, Dare You is um, it's similar in a lot of veins. It's, it's also a little bit different. Um, there's um, Essentially, it's an augmented reality yeah. application. And so... Um, what that means is that it's it's smartphone based, and there are um, visual triggers, um, particularly not necessarily um, auditory or anything like that, but they're they're scripted, um, very finite kind of demarcated triggers that uh, are recognized by the camera. So it's basically the the, the smartphone application which I made has. Um, uh, an array or a series of images which are all the targets and the audience kind of traverses the space which is um, again very kind of crafted and, and um, kind of articulated space and as they hold their phone up to that space so if it's this microphone kind of hold it up like this and that image is kind of analyzed in real time and it's recognized and then it, that's, a, that's a trigger and so with Dare You, Dare You is actually the second um, um, iteration of a larger project called um, Second Story. And so the only animal, um, um, Kendra and Eric, are kind of the primary instigators behind that and have been kind of the main technical collaborator. And so the first edition we did was called Ghost Light, and it was in Blood Alley, um, which was a fascinating and also a problematic space. Um, and this second edition, Dare You, was in a parking lot in Granville Island as part of the Fringe. And with, um, with both of them, the content is video. Mm -hmm. And so it, it already there's a little bit of a leaping off in terms of what the traditional augmented reality is. It's, it's often um, augmented reality kind of works with, um, how to describe this, um, kind of 3D models that, like, things that kind of show up in your um, in your camera that don't necessarily encompass the entire scene that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so if, for example, if I was looking at this microphone, the microphone would kind of turn into a face and it would maybe start talking or something to me. Right. Um, with us, what we're doing basically is we're situating video content, uh, basically overriding the frame of the camera 
Um, so we're basically triggering and just playing full screen video content. But that video content is um, shot from the exact vantage point that you start at so that as you approach it and you're, we know that you're at this angle and this far apart, mm -hmm. that's exactly the first frame of the video and it's shot in this space and it's set in this space. Um, so at that point you're kind of encouraged to follow as the camera pans and we see actors and actresses over here and it cuts or there's, you hear a noise behind you and you kind of move around. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of follow it with you and so you're immersed in that space um, it's kind of like a microscope, though, or like a you're you're looking through the glass. Yeah, yeah. you are. You um, obviously you're you kind of go halfway in terms of probably similar to well, I I, I did a run of Vine Line, so mm -hmm. I, I understand, um, but um, how far you kind of get into that mm -hmm. mixed reality, um, you're you're kind of half immersed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I would say. Um, certain people go a little bit deeper, they're will, willing and ready to go yeah. there. Um, certain people are kind of a little bit reticent to take that leap. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. So it's, it's, it's site specific. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it locative. We, we kind of played with geolocation mm -hmm. as trigger or as kind of um, ingredients to help kind of qualify a trigger, but we ended up always using things in a fairly not a packed space, but a space of about, I don't know, three or 400 feet squared for seven or eight targets. Um, so the way that just the, the camera, the object recognition kind of worked a little bit better in terms of just by itself rather than trying to rely on GPS, which is invariable, or describing kind of exactly yeah. where we're trying to go from the audience. Would GPS need to be more, have, GPS doesn't strike me as something that can be pinpoint pinpointed. It can, but it varies. So, so right. um, with Marae, I've done a lot of locative sound work as well. Yeah. So with the Meme Lab, um, we've made um, one of our first kind of forays into into this um, was a project that we did um, when we were on our residency in the Baltic, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the idea was basically you would just kind of record anything audio and yeah. kind of pinpoint that. Um, that kind of audio track at a particular location, it would only play back if you came to that location yeah. within a certain boundary of that. Um, but GPS depends on the cloud cover, which obviously as we know in Vancouver is quite frequent, so that um, depends on whether you're kind of quasi inside or not. So in that parking right. lot, we're kind of covered, but it's it's not, it's only one layer of old wood. And right. So mo the, the signals can kind of get through there. Yeah. Um, it's just a, there's the interference factor. There's interference. Like if yeah. you, just like if you're on Facebook or Instagram and you're trying to check in or kind of tag where your photo is coming from, um, it'll probably give you a range of places within a block radius right here mm -hmm. because it knows that there's that kind of margin of error. Right. Um, so playing with, you know, like um, Blast Theory, I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with, obviously they kind of um, led the forefront of a lot of this kind of work back in Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, they had a lot of like really, really locative based triggers and stuff like that, and, and I'm not exactly sure what, um, um, how they kind of dealt with it, but I understand, you know, that, that there was, there's always uh, a little bit of more error in that, in that instance. And so obviously right. the, you're kind of getting into a place where you're, you're suggesting mm -hmm. the user and kind of trying to guide them, but also leaving a, a fair amount of room for oscillation, variation? Well, because the because landline happens simultaneously, landline happens simultaneously in two cities. This is a key piece of information. Um, so we start um, audiences in Vancouver at the exact same moment as audiences in Kitchener. So Dustin and I wanted to make a piece that was happening simultaneously. And at first, we really did experiment with the notion of overlaying my instructions onto your city or your instructions onto my city and that was just crazy because it was it was really actually impossible mm -hmm. unless you're in a wide open space um, in terms of urban space it was just it it was breaking our brains to, tr to try and have the same instructions be mirrored mm -hmm. and so uh, that's what moved us more into trying to find, and, and we wanted the piece to be able to move from different cities. So if we figured out for Vancouver and Halifax, which was our first iteration, well, there's no way that, there's no telling that we could figure it out for uh, Ottawa and Calgary. Sure. Like, it would take, you know, a whole other round of problem solving. So that's why we moved off of the 
the geographic landscape into the internal landscape. Yeah. And, and Dustin is really um, influenced by the Situationist movement. And the I was just going to mention that. Yeah. yeah, so the idea of the derive and the idea of the psychogeography of a city and the, the energy lines and, and the movement through the city that's purposeless. Yeah. Because what, so what, what were those mistakes? Because the situation is one of their famous things for the derive was they would take a map of Chicago mm -hmm. and they would try to navigate through London with it. Mm -hmm. It would like intentionally creating mistakes. Yeah. Right? So yeah. like you're following a street and the only thing is a fire escape. You just keep going straight. So you go up and then you're on the roof and yeah. then you're on a new level of city, right? Yeah. So, and they, they would document that. So like what were, what were the, when you were kind of moving away from the geographical to the internal landscapes, um, what were mistakes that you were scared of? S mistakes we are scared of. That's or, a good question. Or, yeah. um, or what, what broke things, I guess? Well, the user always broke things, <laughs> uh, sure. uh, which is great. Users. Users, but it's um, because uh, what became, We knew that we wanted to make space for the people to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then where, where people were always dissatisfied is they either felt like they didn't have enough time or they felt like they had too much time. Nobody was like, that was perfect. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like every, the, you either fell into one of the two camps. So um, the timing of things was, was uh, distracting for people, or not distracting, that was something that felt uh, dissatisfying to the people. What? That's a good question. We made this piece so long ago. Like we mm -hmm. made it. Sure. We made it in this fall of 2013. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Chelsea because she was there and she's nodding. I'm like, how old was my kid? Yeah, he wasn't one yet. Okay, fall of 2013. Um, in a very bleary time of my life. And. And, and I think I think the other thing that w was discordant for us was like how to how to find the other city in the audio track. So we would place audio um, field recordings from the other city into like so in if you s see the show in Vancouver, you'll be hearing the audio will be from Kitchener. Yeah. Um, and Dustin did a really great job recording, especially in Halifax, and he got. Uh, he got some real, like a real sense of spatiality in in the recording, and it, that was disruptive to people. Mm -hmm. So there is a, the one that keeps coming to mind is the motorcycle. There's one moment where the you talked about the motorcycle, the big motorcycle, like oh, yeah. like it comes like right behind you, and it's very loud and it's very present, and it's that was a disruptive moment because you can't tell in that moment if that's happening in real life and you should get the heck out of the way mm -hmm. or if it's in the audio recording. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers your question though because it goes there. Yeah, it goes there. Yeah. I'm just casting my mind back. Yeah. Were there things that didn't work? Like what? No, not, not at all. Like, like, and I, I rather liked um, the kind of emotional prerogative of it. Of, mm -hmm. um, of being forced to um, kind of have uh, think about the city in a different way, like mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, emotionally rather than rationally. Um, we we so often streets are just conduits to. I don't think I went in um, straight lines through the whole piece. Like I think I was like I was in you know we were in mm -hmm. kind of Yale Townish, and so I was like cutting through alleys and lobbies of hotels, and mm -hmm. like I just like I was super zigzaggy. Which yeah. was like great, I think. Like, and that was um, kind of really like I felt kind of um, the theory that you were trying to go for in terms of like the or the 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 way that you were trying to kind of craft the experience, kind of come through it because of the emotional direction in it. Mm -hmm. I just it gave me permission to navigate the city in a different way. So the thing now that we are talking, mm -hmm. the thing that I remembered, um, and I have this, I want to kind of say this and then ask it about Dare You, because sure. I didn't get to see Dare You, but yeah. one of the things that was dissatisfying to me and to Dustin, prob maybe more to me, was uh, that the pod plays that I worked on mm -hmm. and the Commons Project, which was his audio headset piece, um, was the question of aging. Well, it was, that was on the street. <laughs> that was not pre-recorded. 
um, was the question of like uh, the a audience's agency. Yeah. So, so in theater uh, at that time, and still every so often, I'm kind of obsessed with like what is happening right now. Like what is happening right now? What's the problem? What's the what's the potential for everything to fall apart? Mm -hmm. um, and how much control can you put into the audience? With the pod plays, like everything like was well. Kathleen will know this. Like everything was timed to the second. Like you have a, a, it from this water hydrant to that water hydrant is one minute, and that's when the next thing happens. And once you're there, is uh, when I'm going to say this so that you see that, and I have to turn you in that mm -hmm. direction so that you see that it's on your left. Um, but with, so the, the story is happening because I'm telling you a story, but it doesn't feel like the audience has agency in it. If they're truly the character of the play, if they're truly the protagonist or the, they're inside of the piece, then they have to be making some choices. But we, there was no room for them to make choices in, pod, in the pod plays. Mm -hmm. So part of what Landline was, for me at least, was like, how can we make this really live? Yeah. Even though it's pre-recorded. Even though it's, you know, I've recorded the next three versions of Landline, they're all in the can, like they're done. We just go in and take some field recordings and pop it back yeah. in and we're, I mean, let me make it sound so easy. It's not quite so easy. I look at Chelsea again because we're installing the show. But um, so that's where we started to get this idea of like, well, could, could we open that channel of dialogue? At first, we started thinking about like you over there would be telling me where to go in Vancouver, yeah. and I would be telling you where to go yeah. in Kitchener. Um, and I can't quite remember why we discarded that idea. Well, there's, it, it, it's that's probably not even quite the agency that you're looking for, really, right? Like it's, or it is, but it's well, it is, but we don't want to be bossing each other around, right? Sure. We just want you to to actually get in touch with some of your impulses, mm -hmm. um, and and not have my voice bossing you around in quite so much detail yeah. <laughs> as I had to boss you around in pod plays. So did, I mean, with Dare You, mm -hmm. because again, like they're moving the screen to follow the trigger point. That's the impulse as well, right? So yeah. it's, it's um, yeah, that, that, that's something that we thought about a lot. And with, with Dare You more than Ghostlight, the first version, so Dare You was part of the fringe and so there was a ticketing system, mm -hmm. and there was um, there was a you know it's forty seven minutes for all the videos to play kind of back to forth. So we had an hour. So there's roughly thirteen minutes of finding the target of the introduction of the kind of outtake stuff like this. So it's we're providing. We had twenty devices that we're providing. You know, same. So like you're you're taking them back. You're charging them. You're you know wiping the screens stuff like that. Kind of putting them back into. Um, into the pool, so it was. Yeah. Didn't we didn't we didn't give that as much, but it's. I think that it's an important question. Um, there's there's an act of um, engagement, regardless, that starts to at least kind of lessen that a little bit, but ultimately, um, they're narrative pieces mm -hmm. that. Um, allow people to um, kind of follow their own impulse through it, but generally we're trying to kind of script that impulse. And a lot of the, so we work with um, youth, um, um, kind of, yeah, recent graduates or kind of, um, you know, theater students or film, film students for this, and they, there was a lot of um, questioning about how we can kind of encourage the audience to do something at certain times through kind of just the general user experience and the mm -hmm. um, kind of narrative hooks, but without really forcing it or guaranteeing that they're, they're going to be able to do it. There was also, I should mention, um, two of the seven pieces had kind of live performance elements that kind of came in um, either at midpoint or um, towards the end of the piece. So there was one that was kind of a two-part video and so you, it was this kind of film noir piece and you were sitting down kind of on these crates like this and that was kind of the trigger and you would sit down and you were watching it and then it would kind of, you'd, it would end and you were looking like this and then this, it would, it would stop and you would just see the camera, it would go back to the camera view which looked almost indistinguishable from the end of the video and then this performer would walk out, which was one of the performers in the video and she would speak something to you and then she would kind of hold this letter 
in front of you and that was the next target and you'd hold your camera up and then the first frame would be that letter and then you kind of went like this. And so she'd have a bit of a conversation with you as well. So, and there was another one as well, so that we had to kind of have those cues and it was like on a bit of a cycle. Um, so we, yeah, the, mm -hmm. because of that, I think that we weren't really able to um, kind of give it as free reign as possible. Mm -hmm. A good uh, handful of the comments were that people would like it to be more of a scavenger hunt kind of and just right. find what could possibly be um, an exciting target. And with the Blood Alley edition, that happened a little bit when people are, first of all, Blood Alley is a space, and, and this parking lot is a space. They're kind of these moody, kind of textured spaces, obviously, in Blood Alley. It's, the content was all working with people that have long, decades uh, histories in, in Blood Alley, but um, there's, you don't often give yourself, and most people don't give um, other people a lot of permission to spend a lot of time in Blood Alley. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly um, um, t tenuous space, and but people were looking at different pieces of graffiti and just kind of, they were like really trying to wayfind, yeah. um, which got a little bit dangerous and obtrusive in a certain way yeah. for, for the, the traffic that goes through there and the population that's there when you're um, you know, there's um, intravenous drug users and you're kind of waving cameras around with them and, and you know, so we're That can feel threatening. Yeah. Absolutely, right? So we, they kind of knew what was happening and we had PHS workers and stuff like that that, that we'd worked with to try and figure that out as well. But obviously there's a, there's kind of a gentrification issue of, of that, that space um, as well. So it's, there has to be, there's, there's an ethics involved in there mm -hmm. uh, that kind of has to be involved anywhere. That's um, that's interesting to bring up the ethics of it because one of the conversations Dustin and I don't have it a lot because I think landline is pretty set, but it is why part of why we have we have you guys have devices that you provide for people. We're mostly, especially within Canada, we use um, we run the show off of people's personal devices. Yeah. Uh, we alert them that texting mm -hmm. rates apply, but we have spare phones for people who don't have phones. Yeah. Um, which is important to me and uh, became more important to me after I read Critical Play. I'm sure you've read that. Of course he has. <laughs> and if you haven't, you should. Uh, it's an excellent book. Um, but just the idea that the, when the art is taking place off of these devices that are such strong markers of the middle class, that it is exclusionary, yeah, in, inherently exclusionary. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I feel sensitive to that. I don't know. I mean, with landline, I don't know what many in many situations the show is offered for free, uh, and we have devices available for people if they need it. But it's also like, how does the person who doesn't have the device find out about the show in the first place? Mm -hmm. But it does make me think of the pod plays. The very first pod play we did was written by Tetsuro Shigematsu, and it took it was commissioned by the Powell Street Festival. And it took place uh, as a walk around Oppenheimer Park and um, during the Powell Street Festival. And the Powell Street Festival is, um, uh, I, they're very sensitive to the, to the fact that they come in for one weekend at the, end of, at the beginning of August for this big party in the downtown east side. And that there's a, a whole other uh, community that uses the park in different ways throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. So we decided, you know, Pod Plays was going to be free. We had our iPods that we were going to give to you in exchange for something. And it was going to be whatever was of value to you. So we held, you know, people's wallets, credit cards, but we also had somebody's empty wallet. We had a bag, an empty bag, um, because we just decided we couldn't say no. Yep. You can't say no. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have one of the iPods kind of the show, the the walk was ten minutes, and one of the, the one of the audience members didn't come back for about forty five minutes, and so we thought, well, there we go, there's our experiment. But it came back, actually, it came back, and so we were proved wrong, which was great to be proved mm -hmm. wrong in yeah. that sense. Um, and because of the human interface at the beginning of the show and at the end of the show, when you get the device back, it was probably the first time that I've ever had an opportunity to have a conversation with a guy who lives around the corner from Oak Park. Yeah. Um, so that felt like 
a success, that felt to me like a successful housing or installation of that kind of work, mm -hmm. that it was truly available to anybody who came up, yeah. um, regardless of whether you had access to the technology or not, because mm -hmm. we were providing it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we realized early on that we kind of had to do the same thing with, with Dare You and, and with um, Ghostlight, but, uh, and haven't had any issues about that either, mm -hmm. but um, we did a very, very similar thing um, with, um, with Ghostlight, we, the app was in the app store and you could kind of get it. Um, the, the video content is this, like, like yours, the audio content is this kind of big thing. So we had Wi-Fi on site that could download it and yeah. um, whatnot. But um, there was too many changes to last minute with Dare You, so I decided not to put it on the store and I just put it directly on these devices. And Where did you get your devices from? Um, about seven of them were mine. Mm -hmm. um, I do phone development, smartphone development a lot, and uh, so I have the history of devices, or you know, some of them are Marais. Um, um, we, there was four that had, that came from the only animal. Um, mm -hmm. There were a mixture of personal devices and ones that we had kind of gotten through some of the funding for the last part of this. We rented some from Radix. Um, they had them from various projects. Um, and a, a mobile agency that I worked with kind of uh, loaned a few as well. So we ended up having 19. That's good. Yeah, it was, it was, it was enough. Um, the, I don't know, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always, I'm kind of thinking about this a lot with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Harold Fletcher. No. No, Harold Fletcher is, um, he teaches at um, Oregon University, I guess, um, mm -hmm. kind of social practice, and he's kind of one of the premier, um, uh, premier, um, social practice artists, kind of re mm -hmm. like relational aesthetic, um, mm -hmm. kind of coming from more kind of contemporary art. He's um, residents with um, Contemporary Art Gallery on their Fieldhouse project right oh, now. Okay. But he's done a lot of work with this, but he kind of parachutes into spaces and, and kind of does this stuff. And, and what, what I'm kind of curious about both of these is picking up of that part is that like we have, we have to be conscious and kind of respectful of the places that we're kind of going into, but we're like, we're kind of having coming in with kind of a pre-built framework and mostly pre-built content with not necessarily kind of building that content from the ground up. Yeah. Um, that I've heard him speak a couple times, and, and he he mentions like these kind of object failures that he kind of has when he doesn't necessarily um, start from zero with the kind of community. So when he like he gets invited to come and do projects, so he's doing a project in Vancouver with the community, whatever that is. So they're at the Burrard Marina Park House. Um, so that's obviously a fairly, um, you know, localized community. But yeah, he, he, he doesn't ever come with an idea hmm. um, before that. And, and that's um, not necessarily the, the, the kind of economic or logistical world that, that we can kind of stay in. Obviously, the theater can be made that way, um, but maybe not these pieces in that but but like That's do, you, do you feel like it would change like if you if you had a larger kind of co-creative process with people beforehand or uh, well yeah i think it would i mean it would have to change yeah. otherwise it wouldn't be uh honest mm -hmm. um oh it's Often, often when I start the projects, I have an idea in my head of what I want, of what the thing is that I want to make. Yeah. So, um, and it's such a rare opportunity to just make the thing that you want to make that it would be hard to let go of, go like, no, but what do you guys want to do? And then be like, yeah. but don't you think my idea is the best? So uh, I think that there's definitely some value to just go like, no, I'm gonna make the thing that I want to make. Sure. But if your practice is to take the technology or take the possibilities to a group and say like, well, what can we do? I think, um, I think there would be, I mean, immediately I start thinking, well, we have to think about like, what our group, group talk about, like what are, what are the capacities? What are the capabilities? What can we do with this machine? Yeah, sure. And then, uh, which, leads to the inevitable chicken egg question, which is what is, what leads the story making or the, the content developing, whatever you want to call it, narrative story, mm -hmm. content 
thematic, is it the device that leads it or do you find, figure out what it is that you want to say or talk about and then look for the right platform? I mean, yeah. for a while, Dustin and I were considering that we would, that landline would be like a series of envelopes that you open. Right. Right, so it's not, it wouldn't be a smartphone at all. And we also considered it that it would be not time based. <laughs> We're like, well, the show could start and then it would end at a different time for everybody else. And it could take an hour or it could take a week, right. but it depends on your pace. Yeah. Um, so the platform of it, so that's the chicken egg platform. What do you, I mean, have you put very much thought about what um, it would be like to co create with a larger community inside of? Yeah, well, yes, yes and no. Like, like I um, ultimately with the the Dare You project, um, I'm a creative voice, but I'm not the creative lead. It, that's, mm -hmm. that, that is kind of Kendra and Eric, or Eric really on, on this one. Um, and the content in and of itself really is. So the content is solicited, and um, Eric and I kind of work together to kind of. Um, facilitate that in terms of what content works and what content doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've, we learned lessons in the first iteration in Blood Alley and we learned more lessons. Um, um, we definitely had successes based off the lessons that we learned before and then failures and things that we hadn't learned properly um, in terms of what content works and how it works and, and whatnot within that kind of user experience. Um, so so that, that kind of is there, um, but the, the framework again is kind of pre-built, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, come in. Close Kendra. They're scratching um, at the door. Is that Kendra? Uh, maybe. Um, so, oh, maybe. Um, Do you are you coming in? Um, maybe, uh, I have to check the time. We're live streaming, so you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, you know, it's it's a. Uh, because content is one thing, right? Sure. But then the framework of that is... The technology is, it can be relatively rapidly iterated, but mm. it's like, it's the same thing with like lighting. You don't necessarily walk into, um, have a script done, and then kind of on your first rehearsal, go to the lighting director and be like, how do you, how does the script feel to you? What color do you feel? Mm -hmm. Right, or whatever that is. That, that's the, a lot of times the technology takes a little bit more time to kind of mm -hmm. iterate on. And, and, and really the job of the creative technologist in this is to kind of put that as an iteration kind of in the hands of the mm -hmm. content people and the creative people and then get feedback on what's working and what's not and then provide potential solutions or yeah. expansions or deline delineations of that um, and to do that again. And that's, um, that's something I'm familiar with and, and so that, that kind of work quickly like that, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know that there's what exactly it would look like to kind of transcribe like the Harold Fletcher way of doing things into kind of technology. It's like the, the technology itself can be um, kind of red, a red herring. Like I'm not, like I'm, I'm a total geek and, and, and I love doing this stuff um, and I love the kind of conversation between um, kind of creative technology and, and other art forms, but I'm also not interested in pieces that just kind of use technology for technology's sake, and it's really about it kind of supporting something. And if it doesn't need to be that complicated, um, that's great. That kind of means I'm often out of a job, but that's that's okay. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, it, it's the approach for landline, at least, that Dustin and I take is like, yeah. if we can't do it, if we, he and I, can't figure out how to do it, then we can't do it. Yeah. Because we don't have a third person who's smarter than us or, or an expert or, yeah. you know, so so our, our, uh, so our repertoire is our repertoire. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's honest, though, that's good. If you're not kind of stepping out of your bounds, that, that mm -hmm. it, it's because it's a lot of the problems that we deal with is this, is that, people get hung up on the technology um, via the, the content and, and the, the user experience. And you know, we have, since we're providing 20 phones, some are Android, some are iOS, some people are more familiar with the, either patterns, some people come with a Blackberry and don't know how to operate either. Mm -hmm. Obviously people, um, you know, in the, when we did the, um, the, Blood Alley, the Blood Alley version, we were really trying to focus on trying to make the kind of experience 
is seamless and is easy to use for people as, as yeah. much as possible. Um, and then there's kind of there's experts on hand in order to kind of help guide that and stuff as well. Yeah. So you have to, um, yeah, try to make the kind of interface with the technology as kind of um, seamless as possible. Yeah, and we thought about like. How many things are you holding? How many things are we asking you to hold in your hands? Yeah. So we, you know, we put it on. We talked for a while. Like, should we get uh, uh, smartphones and play the sound off of the smartphone? But I think ultimately we decided, let's just put it on the iPod. The iPod goes in your pocket. You yeah. never have to touch it again. Yeah. Don't touch it. And then whenever there's problems with the audio track, it's because somebody touches the iPod. Yeah. Yeah. Or they decide, they're like, I don't like these headphones, I'm gonna use my own headphones, and then it restarts the track and they're yeah. 10 minutes off. Yeah. So um, there's no way of, of uh, getting people to comply. People will always do their own thing, which is the wonderful thing about people. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I've worked on enough apps that that's always the, there's always people that find Compliance. different ways of yeah. breaking things that I know. Like, how would you actually enter that combination? Well, we of things? actually, we the the struggle that we have, Dust yeah. and I, is like we kind of want people to not follow all of our instructions. Sure. Like we want people to find the game inside of it or to take it over, make it their own. Yeah. And so the subtle ways that we can find to say like we say things like how far you go is up to you, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So like you are, this is your experience. Yeah. And some people. Um, do that and and come back to us and say as if it's a criticism oh you know I was having such a great conversation with my friend that I barely was listening to the audio track I'm like that's great mm -hmm. that's actually better than what sure. we had planned is uh, you don't actually need to listen to the audio track all the time it's there if you need it yeah um, so that's all I'm saying about that. yeah I wonder if there could be a way to there could, um, but um, to, to understand, to listen to how much that conversation is going, so to like look yeah. at the, the frequency of text messages and maybe just start to kind of like the audio. If you could kind of fade like, away. I'm just going to step over here. We wanted them to be on like Jeep, like so we could track them GPS yeah. mm -hmm. and then we could watch that there would be a whole installation aspect of it with Dustin or I as the operator yeah. watching them and being able to send, we, at some one point we are talking about like sending them instructions yeah. um, or, uh, or... Yeah, like mission control. Exactly, kind of mission control, yeah. and then you could come and watch us yeah. doing these people, helping these people, but you would be watching the people in Kitchener and the people in Kitchener. Oh, but people home. would watch you operating as well. Yeah, yeah I like that. That yeah, the operator is... Transparency and visibility on yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. but, we, but we didn't do that. We, got, we came out with about 100 ideas. Yeah. And we decided to do this one. But hopefully we'll do another one next yeah. time. Yeah. We'll talk to me if that ever. Yeah. I will. Because um, I don't live in the same city of, as any of my collaborators. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to anymore. No. 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 It's, there are some things that, um, like when push came to shove and we were like actually building the piece. No. When we were actually building the piece in September 2013, he was in Halifax and I was in Vancouver, which was really handy because it was like we had an extra four hours on the workday. Yeah. So, because he was four hours ahead, so he would, I would could work late at night, drop something off, he would get it first thing in the morning, be able to pick it up. Yeah. And it was just like this expanded workday. Um, it was amazing. How, how often, how often did you actually use, well, um, so I guess the question, the tool that you're using is a smartphone. How often did you leverage the, the power of the smartphone and use making a piece about the smartphone? The tool, the, actually the tool we're using is, I would say that we don't, the only time we leverage the actual power of the smartphone mm -hmm. is when we do the piece internationally. Yeah. So when we're doing the piece within national borders, we, we are really only leveraging the ability of a mobile phone. Right. Because it's all SMS text sure. messaging. Yeah. Um, but when we're international, we don't do text messaging because it costs an exorbitant amount. Yeah. Um, so we use Skype. Sure. And yeah. that's when we are, actually it's a smartphone play. Yeah. Um, I guess it could be more smartphone yeah. if we ran the audio track off of your thing. But we also didn't, we also felt like we didn't want people to have the audio track in their keeping. Sure. So. Okay. Uh, we didn't want them to be able to do the show without us, yeah. so we we don't we don't uh, give it up. We don't give it up for free. Uh, except when it's for free. Except for when it's for free, but that's somebody else's business. Yeah. Um, but yours is a smartphone play. 
It's, or dare you is a, I shouldn't say yours. Yeah. Now that Kendra's here, especially. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah dare you is, is, is extremely smart. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes too smart. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, it, so to kind of bring back, like, kind of, you know, when we're talking about kind of lending devices or having devices available in a middle class kind of exclusionary aspect, it's it, it's been able to run on more a ver more variety of devices, um, older iPhones, older Android phones than I initially kind of thought it would be, but it definitely it it's a power hungry beast and it um, it computes a lot of power. Um, it takes a lot of power to kind of compute what it needs to do. Um, yeah, there's some pretty stuff yeah kind of they're hot when they get back in yeah they are. They are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we um, I think when when things get really smart with ours is when people uh, go off script so if yeah. they start sending photographs back and forth sure. or you know uh, Google Earth images or yeah. stuff like that or yeah. they Google each other or, well, mm -hmm. then it then it gets smart but um, mostly it's text messaging mm -hmm. And I don't even know if we could, I suppose we could figure it out, but the new iTunes music player on the yeah. iPhone is crazy, like it's so complicated, I don't even understand how to make it work. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the time to figure it out. I'm like, why can't you play my music, iPhone, that I bought? <laughs> like, the music that I uploaded, why must I be connected to the, I don't get it, so. They just want more of my money. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, they want more of your data. They want more of my data. Um, speaking of, do you have any, is there an archive? Is it, like, do you have any, I guess not really, like it's pretty decentralized, right? Like you, you have the record of the people and maybe their numbers? Or we have a record of the people. We have their names, we have their email addresses and their numbers. Mm -hmm. um, for... The international, when we run it internationally, we log them into Skype identities that we've created. Okay. So, so we actually log. have the log of their chats. Mm -hmm. We can't really publish that sure. because we don't have, we haven't asked for permission. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, screen grabs of conversations that when we did it, uh, that audience members had in 2013 that we got permission from them yeah. to be able to publish them as, as promotional material. But um, we have everybody's conversations. I don't really go back and read them. Um, partly because... your darkest days and you're sitting there. Well, it's because um, as we originally conceived Landline as a one-on-one -on -one show, and then at the, at the end they meet in a video chat yeah, I remember. that nobody witnesses sure. except for those two people. Yeah. And that's, that was very important to Dustin and I that it was not... Uh, it was not mediated, mediated yeah. and is not observed, and that it was purely those people, it belonged to those people. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest reason why I haven't gone back and read the, through the Skypes, and also like, it's very, there's a lot of them. But people often will come back and tell you about, sure. and they'll, they'll share, disclose as much as they want, or they'll email us afterwards and say like, my person was about to go to a wedding and I want to know how it was, like can I, can I get their email address? So we have to mediate kind of those kinds of requests yeah. of people yeah. who want to get back in touch with their mm -hmm. partner, um, which is exciting. Like that's yeah, that's c kind of uh, a best outcome of the piece is that two people would walk away and, and actually continue a relationship outside of the piece. Yeah. 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 Um, what about what about funders? Would they have they ever asked in terms of like a tangible result of, of any of this in terms of any of that data? Um, our uh, landline was created, the funding to, to build landline came out of New World Seed development money, okay. so it wasn't uh, funded pr as a project. Yeah. And then Dustin is really savvy and also based in Halifax, so he gets to access things like Atlantic Canada operation, uh, uh, opportunities funds. Yeah, like, sure. So a lot of the money that we've gotten to tour the piece is actually uh, industry growth money through Atlantic Canada. And then we've received one touring grant from InterArts um, uh, to do this tour, yep. this current tour. And nobody seems to, they just want to know that we did it, which is yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. They don't ask for any kind of um, 
Because I, I guess because it's not like a community building, like it's the, the outcome is that it happened, it's not the number or quality of relationships that have been sure. founded. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But if they did, we have, we have evidence that people talk about it. Do you like the CIA redacted kind of? Yeah, we could redact really everything and just yeah. put the, like, just leave the, the exactly. <laughs> landline, the yeah. landline, yeah. Land, landline, yeah. yeah, was awesome, landline. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing for time over there? Should we take any questions, like five minutes of questions? questions? If there are, I mean, if there are any questions, we don't want to put any pressure on you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, both of you referred to... Um, mistakes, problems. Can you give us an example of something that you encountered that you didn't expect that you, and how you overcame it? Well, the biggest problem that we have, we have two problems when we run the show. Um, one is people showing up on time or not showing up at all. Uh, that's a problem because for our, for landline to work, we need one person in each city. And so we're very sensitive to making sure that the audience, the box office numbers match. Um, so we're, you know, always trying to figure out how to put that in our rider. Like, you need to provide 100% attendance or we're not doing the show. And, and that can be sold tickets, that can be volunteers, that can be staff people, but there has to be one person in each slot. So when Dustin and, and Sean were at the Forest Fringe, like that's a, it's a fringe. So there's not a lot, they didn't have a lot of support from the organized, the quote unquote organization because it's a fringe, like it's just very um, DIY. So they were out in the bar like saying, you, do you want to do a show? You, do you want to do a show? And at the same time, I was in Iceland and, uh, and the presenter had, you know, given a lot of comps away but when people get a comp, they don't always feel obliged to do attend that performance. So we would be standing, like, we just have these empty, so uh, we've built into our pre-show routine, um, well, we've built into our rider that there's, that there ha that we have to keep an eye on attendance and we have to, like, have volunteers on hand. That's the biggest thing because um, because of the pain and heartache and deep anxiety. Like, I cannot sleep because there's 10 people in this city and zero people in that city, and what are we gonna do? So that's one thing. And then the other problem we have is the ghost in the machine. Like, you send standing by to your person, they don't get the message. Send it again, they still didn't get the message. Send it again, they still didn't get the message. Okay, we'll swap it out a new phone, they'll send it back. He didn't get the message. And like, who knows? And then 10 minutes later, they're like, oh, I got five standbys. You know, like there's, that is something that we just cannot, there's, I don't know, it's the cloud cover or the timber or the satellite or the, some leg that we can't, we can't control that. And that is also deeply anxiety producing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, how about you? Um, I, I think I would say kind of the, the, the main thing is, um, you know, we design it to be an immersive experience, and, and that's really the way it is, is that the, you know, I hide the status bar so you don't see your notifications if you're using your own phone or we're providing our own phones that are in airplane mode, so you're not even trying to, like, connect to, you know, Siri or Google or anything like this. Um, but the with, with any of this, you know, I often get the phones kind of back at the end of the run and, like, it's not the app that's open, it's like something totally else. And I don't know how they got there, like yeah. if it's like um, the stocks application, like like why are you st checking stocks after this video? I don't know, maybe like whatever that is. But but I think it's just either that's, that's partly just human error and fingers and we're holding stuff in landscape and it may be the soft keyboard or mm -hmm. whatever that is. Or it may be if they're on their own device, you know, um, if they do get a notification, somebody calls them in the middle of it. What's happening? There's another conversation. How do they, as that audience, obviously you have to kind of give that, that's in their core about what they do about that. Um, you know, when you're kind of looking, when you're kind of encouraging them to make kind of um, 
emotional kind of agency driven decisions around how they're navigating content um, they may come across a place that they have a memory of they may run into a friend on the street mm -hmm. they may uh, be really hungry or have to go to the bathroom really bad and kind of sneak in somewhere or whatever else that is right um, so there's going to be kind of whether those are technological or kind of logistic or kind of emotional or psychogeographic little eruptions Human. that kind of happen. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. And that's, that's what we're doing is to kind of explore the humanity of it. So it's, you just have to embrace that. Yeah, it j makes me think about, um, uh, I did a run of po one of the pod plays with, uh, with a, a presenter. Yep. And it was, it was a version, it was in process. And so, you know, I felt nervous because there was a presenter and she was doing it and I didn't want to do it because I've done it so many times. So I was just following her. And, and I was kind of keeping track on the audio guide and she was like, slow, she was so slow. <laughs> I said to her like, did you not notice that you were getting like falling behind on the cues? And she's like, yeah, but I was just trying to be like the worst audience member. I'm like, Why would you try and be the worst audience? Like, just, just be yourself. Like, <laughs> there's no, the, the audience is gonna hear like, you should be here now and notice that they're not there and they're gonna, like I had no, I had no words in that moment, but I just thought, like, right, of course, the is because I was watching her mm -hmm. do the thing. So it's the like guy, what's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the guy looking at his stock is like, that's the other thing I find with the smartphones, and I think it was part of why Dustin and I moved away from having everything on one device. Is like, it's too easy to get distracted. Yeah. It's too easy to go somewhere else and do something else. And Dustin actually doesn't even have a a phone, a mobile phone. I can't text message him ever, which would be handy at times. But um, yeah. he doesn't. He yeah. doesn't have one. Yeah. It's not part of his personal kind of yeah. uh, cyborg identity. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. There's a um, there's a thinker, a writer, kind of more within kind of user experience and mobile that talks about designing for one eye and one finger. One eye a one eye and one finger. One eye. And that's kind of all you can ever guarantee that a user is going to give your application. Right. Um, and for maybe thirty seconds, normally, right? That's yeah. the thing is that like we're the spikes of attention within these they change over time. If you look at like you know the New York Times will look at metrics of like when people read and spend long times on their page, which is either like at like seven a.m. or seven p.m. Right. Right. So it's the morning commute or when you get home at night. Yeah. Um, and things like that. So, but we're we're in and out of this stuff all the time. If you look at the recent apps on your phone right now, it's everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, we're, we're kind of stepping into um, uh, an ecosystem that we're kind of like swimming uphill, mm -hmm. uh, upstream, um, in terms of kind of... Swimming uphill is even harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So stick with that, swimming uphill. Um, yeah. In terms of kind of the expectations that we're setting on users sometimes. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, well, and that makes me think of my dear friend Kathleen Flaherty and my other dear friend Heather Brown. When I first started working in radio, we said, they're not, lis they're not listening. They're not sitting in a chair listening to the radio. They're doing something else. They're washing the dishes. They're cleaning, you know, cleaning up after supper. So whatever you're giving to them is half an ear yeah. or a quarter of an ear depending on how many people are in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure you've raised this yet. Um, was one of your, uh, one of your concern, or one of the things you want to achieve with your project um, to be accessible? So you were saying to be accessible for the community. Um, but I know it's a theory you, you said you have an so you have an actor planted. Inside the, inside the experience, so you have to have the actor there to get the visual cue. Mm -hmm. right? So without without that, the, the experience wouldn't be complete. I know with some pod play, you're able to download it and do it at your own time. Mm -hmm. right? So um, is that has that been a concern to you, or have you ever thought about trying to make your project accessible and for audience members to experience it whenever they want? Well, the pod plays for sure were, were something and still are something that people can download and do uh, 
when they please, we created a whole podcast series that uh, would give you instructions about where to be in Vancouver, and, and um, I'd have to revise it. I'd have to listen again to make sure all those places actually still exist. But um, you know, the 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 strange thing is like the is how you pay people for that, um, or how you get paid to do something like that. And and ultimately, I I think like the solution is for it to all to be free, um, except for the fact that you know I worked on it, that the the actors worked on it, and how do we fund it. That's where, that's where I get tripped up because I would love to be able to offer everything for free but, um, but people need to be acknowledged for the work that they put in. So that's the kind of conundrum of, of, of the, the user wants, the user expects things to be free. I think a lot of the content on smartphones, the, the people expect it to be free and easily accessed. Um, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of work that goes into them, so how do you uh, sort that out? With landline, we don't want, because because of this I, the adaptation or the idea that the audience is an agent and that we are really playing with this idea of liveness, what is the live aspect of it, um, uh, it is a performance. So you have to show up at a certain time and be there and do the thing. And that's an, an intentional choice to make it a, a performance and an event rather than um, something that you can do. Because somebody said to me, oh, the pod plays are great. I listened to them last night in my living room. You almost don't even have to be outside. And I was like, oh, well, if that's your experience, then I failed. Yeah. If you feel like you can listen to them just fine from inside your bathtub, then I didn't do my job because there's something that's missing and you don't feel that that's missing then. Have you listened to um, Everyday Moments, Fuel Theatre's Everyday Moments? No. It's a series of pod plays. You can find them on the Guardian Culture podcast. Yeah. And they are short plays written for specific times of day in very specific places. Um, but they're like places you can find anywhere. So like the middle of a bridge in the middle of the night with a group of friends okay. or a grocery store at 5 p.m. Those are fun. Yeah. Yeah. I like that to kind of anonymize the, the mm -hmm. space, but to kind of... But yeah. specify it. Yeah. yeah. Um, with, with Second Story, we um, definitely for the Ghost Light, the Blood Alley version, um, we thought about that a lot. Obviously, we, had a, we only had a two-day run of it initially, um, so obviously, having devices available and, and kind of being on site and having Wi-Fi to download the content and making that as accessible and, and, and um, viewable as possible. Um, the app, both for iOS and Android, was also on the App Store um, and people could kind of download it at any point. We, we even found though the, um, you know, the target images that I shot several like iterations, like months to weeks to days before and were kind of continually refining in, in Blood Alley um, moved by the time we actually ran the show. So like the stop sign, which was one, was ripped off. Um, there was graffiti that was graffitied over top of things. There was another thing that had this other thing behind a fence that was kind of put in place of it. And so it's, it's just such a, such a um, dynamic. transient dynamic space, um, which is kind of part of the magic of it, obviously. Um, so I ended up kind of, even if people had already downloaded the, the App Store version by the second day, I was like, just give me your phone and I'm gonna put the new version on it because I haven't had a chance for, App Apple takes seven days at least to kind of vet new apps and Google takes sometimes a, a day. Um, so the, yeah, the, the, the videos themselves, the content itself was also kind of online um, as well so that um, you could look at it at any other time as well. Um, with Dare You, um, Similar concerns that hasn't changed necessarily, but there was kind of too many moving parts at the end that we decided just to kind of host it, and that will go online eventually, and people will be able to look at it. But yeah, it's you know, it's lit in a certain way. Um, the with Dare You, the yeah, nothing like none of the targets will be there anymore. Blood Alley, we were working with like the actual environment, the actual wall, the actual texture of the cobblestone. Um, so you could conceivably go back there now, well, not right now because the light value, obviously you'd have to be there during the daylight, um, um, but you could conceivably go back and re-trigger things, but with uh, um, Dare You, 
you wouldn't be able to. You could st still eventually kind of watch the videos even in that spot as well, but the mood, the lighting, that kind of stuff will change as well. Um, and that's just just kind of part of it in terms of the, the crafting of the production of it. Obviously, there's you um, um, delineate kind of that experience a little bit. For landline, um, we have we've we've established parameters that we need for our uh, for where it's going to be presented. So we know that it has that the venue has to be somewhere re relatively quiet. So there's two spaces involved. There's like a box office space, and then there's a meetings chat space at the end. So we know that we need those two spaces. We know that we need to have stable and strong internet connection because we run about like three or four different links. Our box offices are talking to each other, Dustin and I are talking to each other, and then there's the video chat, so we need to be able to support all that. And then we want both, all of those things to be um, dropped down somewhere in the city that is interesting to walk around in. So there's some presenters that we could explore, um, or you know, there's some presenters that we've decided not to chase after because they're in art centers that are in very uh, pastoral parks, for instance. So if you walk for you walk the distance that you can walk in 10 minutes. So if the so our desire is that within that 10 minutes you pass through a variety of different spaces. So that there is park space, there's retail space, there's maybe residential space. So we're looking for a place in the city that has those options so that when an audience member is following their impulses or their instincts, they have a variety of places to go to, they're not inside of the same space or they're not on a grid uh, without any option. That's how we determine, or that's what we hope for. Um, we also look at things like safety, so for instance in, in Kitchener they're going to be doing the show at 9 p.m partly because we figured 6 p.m. is pretty much the earliest time we could get audience on a weeknight in Vancouver. Um, it's still, I think, pushing it a little bit that we're going to have people wandering around downtown Kitchener with headsets on at between 9 and 10 p.m. That does feel like it's on the edge of safety for us, um, but we are going to just go with it. Because um, that's this is the you know we discussed that with the presenter and 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 found the place that we feel like is the safest. Um, so that's another another. Uh, not only do we have to find a place in the city, but we have to find a place in the day uh, where it's feasible in both places that we we, we can uh, attract audience and that it's safe for them to walk around. I mean, there's a real kind of desire on our part to have it so far apart that it's nighttime where you are and morning time where I am and you get that real kind of um, dynamic, dramatic uh, contrast. We haven't been that far apart yet. We've only been, I think the farthest we've been apart is four hours. Um, yeah, for us it, it's there's largely similar concerns. Um, we, we found um, with Blood Alley uh, at a certain time of the day, the sun would kind of come over the um, south-facing buildings and kind of throw all the kind of image targets on the north wall into havoc, um, just drastically different light values. So trying to kind of have the application have readings of several different times a day um, with um, Dare You as well. It was inside and lit, um, but there was still some ambient light that kind of came in. Um, through a couple different entrances to the car park, and so the tar there was different targets for 6 p.m., for 7 p.m., for 8 p.m., and for 9 p.m., all of which kind of just triggered the same video. Um, that's something I would like to not have to manage as much, because that just takes a lot of my um, kind of space <coughs> mentally, but um, it, it's, when we're, we're, we're really, it's, we're talking about spaces that, um, that work 
for other reasons rather than just working technically, and my job is to kind of figure out how it can work technically. Um, with Blood Alley, obviously there's a dynamic history there. It's a very evocative space. Uh, with the, um, the car park in Grumble Island, it was a evocative space, not necessarily um, historical. I have no idea about the, the history of that building um, per se, but I think that the, there's, um, there's more kind of logistical or strategic partnership or funding kind of um, um, kind of inspired reasons why those spaces were chosen, but but obviously um, they they kind of work separately. With Bullet Alley, we really kind of took content up from the ground, and with Dare You, we kind of put content in there and created for that space. Um, both of which kind of led to different results, but both exciting results. Um, In the Oppenheimer incident, yes, for sure, that the, the, the piece itself is about that space. And um, the piece uh, went through two drafts. The first draft, uh, Tetsuro actually had a, a personal experience when he went to, when he was working on the play, he went down there with a video camera to tape the walk, to videotape it, so that he could go home and refer to how long it takes to walk from here to there and what he saw and all that stuff. But um, as we were discussing earlier, having cameras down inside the downtown east side is, uh, is, can make some people feel very vulnerable. And he was uh, chased out of the park and, and took off. So the first draft of the play, he was recounting that experience. So it starts as kind of a historic tour, cultural tour of Oppenheimer Park from the point of view of a Japanese Canadian, and then is interrupted by the contemporary uh, life of the park, the day-to-day -day life of the park. And uh, we were dissatisfied with that because it left the sense of the park as a dangerous space and as a space that was not welcoming and as uh, the protagonist is chased out and, and decides never to come back, which is not not uh, the... The Powell Street Festival has like a very deep dialogue with the community and is trying to address some of those fears inside of the Japanese Canadian community who are like, we should just have the festival somewhere else. Um, they're trying to build bridges. So they were not satisfied with the piece either. So we gave Tetsuro the um, assignment to go back to the park and to talk to, like, to, talk to people, um, which he did and he, um, had I think a transformative experience for him that he that he brought into the, the piece. So yeah, in that case, that piece specifically is very much about what you're talking about, the social and cultural dynamics. And, the, and it also does exactly what I wanted them to do, which is to layer these stories. Like this city is layered with stories. It's all over the, and, and communities and they're all kind of stacked on top of each other. And I think the Oppenheimer incident is one that really successfully shows that those things are all here at the same time. Yeah, again, I guess with, with the, the Blood Alley edition, all the content came from the community. So mm -hmm. so we worked on the animal, worked with Portland Hotel Society and had a series of open sessions where people could come and give their stories about it. And so everything mm -hmm. that there it was a recap, uh, an account of what something that actually happened in Blood Alley over 30 years or something like that, I think. Um, so there were stories of uh, a girl who moved down from, ran away from her parents, moved down from Powell River, that was the first place he came, somebody gave her acid, and she just like lives living in that family side ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. People that crashed their bikes into each other and like fought and then have been husband and wife for 30 years. Um, some like heartbreaking and like heartwarming stories uh, from that, and so there was sixty stories or something like that that were volunteered, um, and kind of out of that, that, that those were filtered and they were kind of reenacted um, and directed and stuff like that. So the um, yeah, that content was all like very specific, and it happened mm -hmm. there. So it was, I think it's fairly true to the space and ethical. And, So I think we found an ending. I think you did. I think it was wonderful. I thank you for 
for being our um, you know salon leaders and I would like to uh, remind everybody that we are have this conversation has taken place on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations and um, we are very grateful for that. And we're also very grateful for, to the Playwrights Guild of Canada and the Canada Council for helping us get you guys together. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. That was really fun. Yeah. 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 And high five. <laughs> And if you haven't yet bought your ticket to Landline, Chelsea is here to assist you if you want to. She can do it for you. She's got it. She can do it. It's all there for the taking. That was really fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. She did it. Yeah.